All right, everybody, let us begin. I'm going to pray for us and um, kind of stalling, waiting for our computer person to get here. She's two minutes out. And I have a big table talk for you today. You excited about that one? There's one table talk, and I'm super interested in your response tonight because it's a big question. So let me pray for us and we'll get started. Thank you, Lord God, for bringing us here tonight. Thank you for your word and how it uh, enriches and directs our lives. Give us wisdom to see truth that maybe we haven't seen or maybe we've overlooked. And help us to embrace your calling on our life, your truth in our life, and help us to be different because of your interaction in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, I don't, I'm not going to have slides until she gets here, but let me just review a little bit. Nope, you're good. Um, of all the world's holidays and celebrations and festivals and parties and feasts, how many were given by God? Seven. seven. Only seven. God gave us seven. Not, not us. God gave his people seven. So only seven. Um, of, hi, Terry. Hi. Glad you're here. Thank you. I'm on slide four. Of all the world's holidays, only seven were given by God. These seven celebrations were intended to be, we've talked about this for seven weeks, uh, six weeks, markers in time, reminders of God's activity in the past, and rehearsals for God's activity in the future, right? These are Moedim, they're Mikras, they're rehearsals, they're special times. So here's my table talk question for you today. Next slide, please, Terry. Thank you. As Gentile followers, that's all of us. All of us are Gentiles, I think, pretty sure. Um, as Gentile followers of a Jewish Savior, what role should these God-given celebrations play in our lives? Most of you have been here for most of these talks. You've heard what most of these things are about. So I want you to discuss... And I hope there's some disagreement at your tables and you're okay with disagreeing with people you love. And I, just what role should these things play, if any, in our lives? We got to fight? We got to fight? Really? Okay. Oh, good. All right, I want, to hear your, I want to hear your thoughts. And I'm not saying there's a right thought or there's a wrong thought. I just want to hear your thoughts. Because there's two, there's two extreme positions that a lot of people take when we start talking about this stuff. One is, who gives a you-know-what? Who cares? They're just Jews. The other one is, oh my gosh, we've got to put these on our calendar right now and start celebrating and we're somewhere in between there. Uh, at least I am. And I'd love to hear your thoughts. I want to hear, I want to go to the Shannon Shannon table first, because you were so worried about the table talk. <laughs> what, did, what did your table say? Anybody there? Can we push time out? And do you have an answer for that question? No. It's, we're all, I mean, kind of just... Yeah, why isn't this mainstream, basically? Yeah. Do you have an answer? No, we're asking... Why do you think? Why do you think? <laughs> My opinion is... Yeah, what do you think? Each religion, Baptist, Methodist, Pentecostal, whatever it may be, somewhere along the road decided what they would follow and what they wouldn't. And what they didn't feel pertained to them. They didn't teach so people have been to church their whole life and never really knew the meaning of Passover. I mean, if you never know, you don't know, right? And if you're not the type of person to go do your research on your own, you're never going to know. Hmm. So, yeah, I mean. It's really interesting. So, can I give you my, please? just, oh, it's, a, it's opinion. I don't know the answer to that. But my opinion is that since 324 A.D., when Christianity became an official religion and a state religion, and today a global religion, 
billions of people who call themselves Christians um, under this global church, there has been since then, since 324 AD, a systematic attempt by smart people, scholarly people, people who teach in modern day preacher schools, pastors, there has been a systematic, I think, attempt to de-Hebrewize the scripture. Um, our world is very anti-Semitic because those are God's people and our enemy hates them. And there's a reason that there's no other, there's no other group of people on our planet that have, since they've been in existence, had to survive multiple attempts at eradication. There's a plan, I think, a spiritual plan at work for us as the grafted in people of God to be ignorant of these things. Because the more we understand about our Jewish Savior, do what? The more they would less hate they would get. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So I, I think the reason most of us have not been taught this is most of our, most of the people that came through education, came through preacher schools, came through seminaries over the last two, three hundred years haven't been taught that. And the reason they haven't been taught that is there's this systematic approach, and it has been since 324 AD, wipe out all Jewishness from the Bible, or at the very least ignore it. That's my opinion. So where did you land? You said you were drawn to the celebrations, learning them? I mean, I That's interesting. Like something that we should all learn more about and understand better, and, and why haven't we looked at that? Interesting. What'd y'all say? The arm wrestle table? Hmm. I appreciate that answer. Are we, uh, from, from what I can get from Scripture, we're not commanded. And to, to, my, to my view, it's not a salvation issue either. So, but as a Christ follower, it would be terribly important to know what the positions are festivals and we, we talked a little bit at the, at the table about the significance of each feast or festival and what it meant and every detail had a meaning tied to it so it, it's just that much more you know it ties things together just that much tighter hmm. to it that's cool uh, how about ladies table would y'all say How about y'all's table? You made me wait, so I'm expecting a really good. <laughs> really, kind of, kind of the same thing. Well, and, and, and everything, everything these last few weeks of all, and as you've said, 
many times over the last month or so, you know, everything that points to Jesus. Well, I think yeah. that uh, as followers of Jesus, we're no longer under the law because Jesus fulfilled the law. But at the same time, we are worshiping the ultimate sacrifice, the one who fulfilled the law. And it, it helps us to understand just what Jesus did on the cross. Uh, we talk about Passover, okay, he died at Passover celebration. He was raised again on the day of Pentecost. Uh, you said something about being ignorant ignorant of this book right here the Bible and that's that's uh, it's my fault partly because we don't teach people about the Jewish part of Jesus yep we're blind to it and we're deaf to it and we need to start teaching it to in our groups in our homes in our churches uh, and I won't get into all of it, but Paul said in Hebrews, uh, I think everybody knows it. Don't go, don't go there yet, because we're going to Hebrews. We're going to Hebrews tonight. <laughs> you're, you're getting ahead of me. Do you know what I learned? I, I was yesterday years old when I learned this. Mm -hmm. So um, the book of Hebrews, Paul wrote the book of Hebrews, and it's written to the Hebrews, the Hebrews written to Hebrew people. But the book of Hebrews, you can't understand it. New Testament book, huge theological implications in the book of Hebrews. You can't understand the book of Hebrews unless you understand the book of Leviticus in the Old Testament. Because Hebrews is Paul's commentary for Jesus followers on Leviticus, which is the law. It, the, it's a New Testament commentary from Paul, who was a Jew. Here's how you, as a Gentile person, as a, somebody grafted in, should understand the law. It's beautiful. We're going to look at it tonight. Thanks for bringing that up. What did y'all what did, what did say? How did, what, what role should this play? Vic, they're always pointing at you. Yeah. Uh, well, I actually spent a lot of time the first week but, like, thinking about this just because I was intrigued that I didn't know more about it. And the conclusion that I had kind of came just personally was that it's almost like Memorial Day. We're not in a war time, and I don't have anyone in my family who's died because of a war. But during Memorial Day, we're in a time of remembrance, hmm. a time like just often falls so of historically what if, what these people that have died, um, so that we who we are to, we can be who we are today. So when it comes to these, we're not under the law to have to do the sacrificing and all of that. But I think it's kind of important for me personally when these things come around to just be in a time of remembrance of, you know, like during Passover, the people who followed the commands and their outcome, the people who didn't, and, you know, that he always fulfills his promises and, and things of that nature. So even the ones that have already come into fruition and fulfillment, um, it just is a time of remembrance of, I mean, it was in the Bible, so there's got to be some weight, some value hmm. that he wanted us to get from it, even if we're not under the law to be Jewish. That's a really good answer. So uh, just my conclusion, just for me personally, is basically what y'all said. For me, I want to understand these because I want to know my Savior better. And so if it was important to Jesus, I want it to be important to me. And as an observant Jew, which we're going to see tonight, Jesus celebrated all of these festivals every year of his life. Um, and God's covenant with Israel is eternal. It never stopped. It has not stopped. God's promise to Israel to be their God and to see them through all these things and to bless the world through them uh, and to ultimately reclaim them as his own, that covenant is still in effect. And so... I'm not part of that covenant. You're not either. You're just a sorry old Gentile. With, as Paul said last week, just no hope because we couldn't get in, but we got grafted in. But just like you said, that's a holiday that, you know, I don't really have a lot of skin in the game because I'm not Jewish, but I need to know what it 
represents because there are some things that God wanted to teach his people and I've been grafted in with those people and I'm going to spend eternity with those people. I should have some kind of understanding. I, I like y'all's answers. Those are good. So nobody said, just forget about it. Why do we even bother? Man, I'm glad to hear that. Ed? Mm-hmm. Uh, because we were grafted in to, to kind of paraphrase the Bible uh, didn't it command everyone to uh, keep these festivals in all lands, in all generations, in all homes. He commanded his people, the Jewish people, Leviticus and Exodus, those people were commanded to do that. Was that that's my, kind of my question. Being that we're grafted in, we're not necessarily Jewish, but grafted in, are we not under that commandment? You know? No, because those... Festivals and feasts in the Old Testament had the three elements that we've been talking about, the historical, the agricultural, and the prophetic. Well, the agricultural doesn't really exist anymore. It's not a thing. They, they still harvest at basically the same times. They still do those things at basically the same times. But that's not really why they celebrate anymore. So today, Jewish people celebrate those things to remember but God designed them not just to remember, but to look forward. And Jesus has already fulfilled it. I'm going to show you tonight, I think, I hope I can convince you, that of the seven, almost all of them are fulfilled. And so if the point is to look towards what God is going to do in the future, well, God has already done that. God has already fulfilled, in my opinion, six of the seven feasts. Sacrificial animals and, you know. Yep. We're going to look at that tonight, too. Okay. Paul's commentary is going to help us tonight. But We're going to get there. My, my, my view is uh, the last three. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Should we not be celebrating that? Let's look at them, and then let's, let's talk. So uh, let's move forward, Terry. Uh, we've got a lot to get through tonight. All the spring festivals have been fulfilled. We've already covered this um, ad nauseum. So we can, let's, just, let's just move forward. The fall festivals, there are two camps, and we're going to get to both camps tonight. There are a lot of, and I'm going to say messianic Jews, Jewish people who have been brought up Jewish, who have accepted Jesus as their Savior. There's a lot of those scholars, Messianic Jewish scholars, who will tell us one thing, and there's a lot of them that will tell us another thing. So I'm going to give you both camps when it comes to these last three festivals. We've got the one we looked at last week, Trumpets, which um, I think points to the return of the Messiah. Today we're going to look at the Day of Atonement, which you just talked about, and the Feast of Tabernacles. So let's look first at the first one on the calendar, the, the one after trumpets, and that is the Day of Atonement. You might see it on your calendar as Yom Kippur. You might see it as the Day of Atonement, the Day of Covering. It is known as the Day of Judgment, okay? Tradition, Jewish tradition, also calls this day the Wedding Day of the Messiah. Does this language ring familiar to anybody? Wedding Day, of, what, is it, what does it remind you of? Anybody? The bridegroom. Thank you. And the church is the bride. bride. And when he returns, there's this wedding feast that, that John sees in Revelation. So the language is reminiscent of that. They've been calling it that for generations. So you can find the instructions for Yom Kippur or the Day of Atonement in Leviticus 16. 
and Deuteronomy 27 through 28. We're not going to read all of it. I'm going to summarize it for you. So Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement, is the one day a year, one day a year, when God judged the sins of the nation of Israel, all the people. God would, as a whole, judge them. Um, on Yom Kippur that day to cover, and that word is super important. Thank you, Terry. To cover the sins of the nation of Israel, to cover the sins of the people. Here's what happened. Two goats and one bull would be selected. And again, these instructions are Leviticus 16, uh, uh, Deuteronomy 27 and 28. Select two goats, one bull. One of the goats, they would cast like a lot. They would roll a dice. And one goat would be called the Yahweh goat, and one goat would be called the Azazel goat, or we call it today the scapegoat. Azazel was the wilderness that uh, we'll see in just a second. So there's the Yahweh goat, the Azazel goat, and then a bull. And the bull was a sin offering for the high priest. I'll explain it in just a second. Um, the next slide should say this, to cover the sins of the people, the high priest on this day which is in uh, late September, October, the high priest would place his hands, this is at the temple, place his hands on the head of the Azazel goat, the scapegoat, and symbolically he would pray a prayer and he would symbolically place all the sins of all the people of Israel onto the Azazel goat. And then that goat would be taken outside the city and driven into the wilderness. Now, I read something today that I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to break down for you in, in a minute because it's, it's amazing. Tradition, this was not in the original instructions, but later on, Jewish rabbis started this tradition of when the priest would place the hand on the Azazel goat, he would also take a strip of, of red wool, a string of red wool, and he would break it in half and tie half of it to one of the horns of the Azazel goat and tie the other half to the door that leads into the temple. And I'll show you that in just a second. We'll talk about it in a minute. So the Azazel goat is driven out into the wilderness and left to wander. Symbolically for the people, the sins of the people have left. They're gone. We've taken care of them for the year. Next slide, please. To cover the sins of the people... Then the bull is sacrificed, and the bull is sacrificed for one reason, to atone for the sins of the high priest and his family. Um, Hebrews is going to tell us later that there's no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. And so in order for the high priest to be ready to carry out this ceremony for all the nation of Israel, he had to sacrifice a bull for himself and his family to be right with God. Then the high priest would sacrifice the Yahweh goat, and he would catch the blood of the Yahweh goat in a bowl, and that goat is sacrificed for the sins of the people. Then the priest would take the bowl with the Yahweh goat blood, and he would take the, that blood through the veil of the temple into the Holy of Holies, and he would sprinkle the blood all over what's called the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant. So let me give you just some, some visuals. Okay, so the, this first picture is a reconstruction at the uh, Jerusalem Museum of the temple. That's what the temple would have looked like. Solomon's temple. When Jesus was alive, this is what the temple would have looked like. It's a huge structure, enormous. So um, the sacrificing and the teaching and the all the talking, the stuff like that would happen in the courtyard closest to the screen. Do you see the circular steps? Jesus actually did some teaching right there, which is amazing. Um, but this is where the Gentiles could meet out here, the women could meet out here, the priests, everybody. This is kind of the general assembly area. This is not like going to church on Sunday. Okay, this is where the sacrifices would happen. And then in that door, there's, there's one door at the bottom of the, at the top of the steps, and then there's another door that leads into the giant building. Do you see the giant building? Okay, the next slide is kind of a really crude diagram. You get into that giant building, and there's a place called the holy place, and then you can't really see it, but there's a wavy line, and then a thing called holy of holies. You with me? So the holy of holies is the little chamber, it's a little room in the very back of the temple where the Ark of the Covenant rested. 
The Ark of the Covenant that God gave the people when they were wandering out in the wilderness, that's where it ended up, right there. And the, the space between the angels, God, God said, that's where I'm going to reside. I'm going to reside on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. And so once a year, one man could enter through that veil, which is the wavy line, which was a curtain that separated the Holy of Holies from the holy place, and then a door that separated all of that from everything else. You with me? So that veil right there was 60 feet high, if that gives you any idea of the scope. This building is, how high is this building, Vaughn? You've been up there 25 feet? So three times a, cur a curtain, it's a curtain three times as high as this building and 30 feet wide and four to six inches thick. It was said that you could put a horse on either side and a, and a horse on each side could not open the curtain. <laughs> it's an enormous, huge curtain to symbolize God is holy and you don't approach him because if you do, you die. And so once a year, on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, the high priest, after sacrificing a bull for himself and his family, and then sacrificing the Yahweh goat, would take the blood, he'd walk, through the, he'd walk up the steps through the holy place, the, cur the curtain of the Holy of Holies would be opened, he would walk in, the curtain would be shut, and then he would sprinkle the blood on that Ark of the Covenant to satisfy God's requirement that blood had to be shed for the covering forgiveness of sin. Are you with me in this? Next slide, please, Terry. This once-a-year celebration, I, I keep using the word cover because Kippur, Yom Kippur, means the covering. It was a once-a-year covering of the sins of people, of all the people of Israel. This was not a permanent solution because guess what happens next October? We got to do it all over again. We got to find the Azazel goat, the Yahweh goat, and the bull. We got to do it all over again. This was a rehearsal for there was going to be coming a permanent solution to sin when it wouldn't just be covered, but it would be taken away. So, did you do your homework last week? I know you did because you texted me this morning. What was my homework? <laughs> Matthew 27. How many of you read it? Okay, here's your table talk. And you, you might want to look at this verse specifically. Why do you think Matthew included the specific detail that he included in Matthew chapter 27, verse 51? Verse 51 is, is a bedrock faith scripture that you have to understand. So Matthew 27, 51, why does Matthew, the good Jewish boy, include that detail? All right, Why? Why would Matthew include that? Matthew 27 is the last day of Jesus, and Matthew has been so careful to point out the specific times and hours when Jesus did all these things. Why, why does he include that detail? What do you all have? I have no idea. No idea? <laughs> Come on, Jared. <laughs> what do you got, Vic? I just said that um, the veil was symbolic of the curtain. So the veil is the curtain. Yeah, so yeah. that there's no more separation, you know, like where you have to have a priest that stands for your sins or stands in between the relationship between you and our Savior. Yep. Did I get that? That was the whole point. It's so important that the Hebrew people, Jewish people would have been reading Matthew's gospel because that's who he wrote it for. When he includes that detail that the 60-foot high, 30-foot wide, 4-inch thick curtain that has separated our people from God for 4,000 years and only one man could go in there once a year and when he did it was on my behalf to make sure my sins were covered. When Jesus died, that ripped in two. It would have been impossible to have ripped that in two. It was a supernatural act that that thing got ripped in two. And if you're a Jewish person who's banking on the the high priest atoning for your sins once a year, that has to land pretty heavy on your shoulders that the priest doesn't have to go through there anymore, that a sacrifice has already been made. Here's Hebrews chapter 10, verses 18 through 20. Remember, Hebrews, Hebrews is Paul's commentary on Leviticus. Here's what he said. 
when sins are forgiven, talking about the forgiveness through the death of Christ, there is no more need to offer sacrifices. My friends, the blood of Jesus gives us courage to enter the most holy place where God is by a new way that leads to life. And this way takes us through the curtain that is Christ himself. That's, that's awesome, isn't it? You, if you're a Jewish person and you're reading Matthew's letter, you're like, bing, I get it. Holy cow. It makes perfect sense. Yom Kippur was a yearly covering of sin. Jesus Christ became the eternal removal of sin. Not that sin doesn't exist anymore, but that those who have passed through his blood, those who have accepted his sacrifice, our sin has been removed. God placed, according to Hebrews, the sins of us all on him. And he became the scapegoat. He became the sacrifice. He was the last sacrifice. Now here's, let's go back to the little thread. The little thread on the goat and the little thread. Can you go back to the picture of the door? Do you mind? I know that's a, that's a lot. So one more, right there. So tradition has told us that the Jewish leaders, um, the historians, they, 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 they wrote that they started to tie this piece of red wool onto the Azazel goat's horn and onto that first door right there. And if they did it right, the Azazel goat would be led, led out into the wilderness. And at some point, the red wool that was left on this door would turn from red to white. It was a supernatural thing. And it kind of goes back to Isaiah, where Isaiah the prophet said that when the Messiah came, he would make your, skin, your sins, though they be as scarlet, red, he would make them white as snow. And he's talking about this. So the temple was destroyed. This building was destroyed by Titus, uh, the Roman general, in 70 AD, about 40 years after Jesus died. Jesus died in about 30 AD, 31, 32 AD. The temple was destroyed 40 years later. Get this. Okay, according to Jewish historians, there were some bad omens 40 years before the temple got destroyed that they were interpreting as God was mad at us. And we're going to look at one of them in a second. Uh, but one of them was for 40 straight years, the red strip of cloth that hung on that door, for 40 years until the temple got destroyed, it always stayed red. It never turned white again. Do you know why? Well, Paul just told you, because there's no more need for sacrifice. The bad omen, um, we'll, we'll get to the bad omen in just a second. I just think that's amazing. I just learned that today, that this supernatural thing is not biblical. It's, it's a Jewish tradition, and maybe it's true, maybe it's not, but Isaiah references that, and coincidence that Jesus died, and then 40 years later, the temple is destroyed. And during that 40 years, gosh, our sacrifice, they're not working. <laughs> I just find that amazing. Let's move on to the last of the feasts. It's the Feast of Sucket, which, mean tent, which means tents. You might uh, hear it as the Feast of Booths, the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Ingathering, because it's a harvest festival, or the Feast of All Nations. Um, it's five days after Yom Kippur. It's five days after the atonement of sin. So it's a huge celebration. It's the celebra it's a very, it's the most joyous celebration of the seven. In fact, Jewish rabbis have said, you don't know what joy looks like until you've been to Jerusalem and seen the Feast of Tabernacle celebrated. It was such a joyous occasion. Um, they celebrated the final grain harvest of the year, and it was a time to rest from your labor of harvesting all year long. It's one of the three that God required that you could only celebrate it in Jerusalem. The other four, you can celebrate it wherever you live. You celebrate these festivals, but Passover, Pentecost, and Sukkot have to be celebrated in Jerusalem. So just packed city, 
hundreds of thousands, millions of people. Um, Passover when Jesus was alive, a million to two million people. So just tons of people there celebrating this festival. Um, This was a reminder of the time when God's people wandered in the wilderness. Remember, they came out of slavery. Uh, They were supposed to take the promised land. They disobeyed because they were afraid. Uh, And God said, all right, we're going to wait till a generation of you dies off, and then I'll give the land to you young folk. And for that 40 years, they wandered in the wilderness, and they had to live in tents. And they had to look outside the tent to make sure that they could see the pillar of fire or the pillar of cloud that was guiding them, that was God's presence with them. So that was, that, that, my Evernote just died. Here we go. Sorry. Yes. Leviticus chapter 23. Here's the instructions for this festival. Remember to begin the festival of shelters or booths or tabernacles on the 15th day of the seventh month after you have harvested your crops. Celebrate this festival for seven days. So it's a week-long party in honor of me and don't do any work on the first day or on the day following the festival. So it's a seven-day party. And then on the eighth day, take a break. Just have a rest. So an eight-day party. The, the Jews, they know how to party, y'all. They know how to have a, how, how to have a good time. Um, Let's see, pick the best fruit from your trees and cut leafy branches to use during the time of this joyous celebration in my honor. And they would cut those things to build little temporary tents. And today, and in fact, um, you should Google it, not now, but later, look up the, the Feast of Tabernacles and how it's celebrated today in Jerusalem. Jews today will, in their front yard, build a rickety little tent. Or on some of their balconies at their apartments, they'll build a rickety little tent. I saw a guy who built a tent around his bicycle and he drove his bicycle to work. They're hilarious, but they still do this. And they actually move out of their apartments, out of their homes, and they live in these little tents for seven days to remember um, how God guided them through the wilderness. Um, a couple of thoughts there. They, they were living in tents. Um, they were to celebrate God's provision during wandering and uh, to remember that God was with them, that God actually dwelled with them. For 40 years, God sent a pillar of fire at night and a pillar of cloud at day to be his presence in their camp. And when the pillar of cloud moved, you better move too because God's moving I better be ready to move. So these tents were temporary. You could get in and out of them fast. You could pack them up fast and get on down the road. That's what God wanted them to remember, that there needs to be a time when you recognize that God is moving and when God moves, you move. There needs to be a part of your brain that remembers this is all temporary, but there's something permanent coming. This was what God wanted them to remember. So here's what I want to just say to you today. Uh, I, I left out a scripture and I shouldn't have. I just forgot. Matthew 1, 22 through 23 says, so the Lord's promise came true. This is the story of the birth of Christ. Just as the prophet had said, a virgin will have a baby boy. He will be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. The whole point of celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles, was to remember, oh yeah, God was with us. When we wandered, God was with us. The word tabernacle means God was in our presence. God tabernacled with us. John 1.14. If you have a Bible on you, turn to John 1.14. If you have your U version, turn to John 1.14. I apologize for not putting it on the screen. I didn't get it to Chasey in time. Here's what the scripture says. John is talking about Jesus. He's using the word logos or word. So when you see the word, word, it's Jesus. Here's what it says. So the word, Jesus, became human or flesh and made his dwelling with us. The word is he tabernacled with us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen his glory, the glory of God's one and only Son. So Matthew and John, when they're describing the birth of Jesus, both say, both use Feast of Tabernacles language. We're supposed to be looking for this Messiah, and Matthew and John both use language that would draw a Jewish person back to the Feast of Tabernacles. Oh yeah, 
God is with us. E- even this guy's name means God is with us. And the fact that he left heaven and came and tabernacled here, dwelt with us. It all, it, it, it's all feast language. So I want to give you two interesting elements. There's so much, guys. There's so much we could talk about. But I just want to give you two, I, I think they're really cool elements, called uh, the drawing of the water or the water drawing ceremony uh, and then the illumination of the temple. So part of the celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles was these two things. Drawing of the water. So a priest would go, he would walk from the temple, down out of the temple, down into the old city of Jerusalem, David's city, and he would go to the pool of Siloam. The water in the pool of Siloam is real cool, it's special water, it's living water, which means it's always moving, it comes from a spring. Uh, Jesus did a miracle there. All of Israel's kings were anointed kings at the pool of Siloam. The priest gets a bucket, a golden pitcher of water, of, a golden pitcher, and he dips it in the pool of Siloam, and he has now this pitcher of water from the spring where all of Israel's kings have been anointed as king. He then takes that, and there's a parade from the pool of Siloam back up to the temple. It's a huge party. There's shofars blowing and people celebrating. It's a party. as he march- It's a parade. He's marching this big tub of water back up to the temple, and he pours the water into um, this big laver. It's a big bronze pot. And they use this big bronze pot as for offerings and for cleaning and stuff like that. It's right in the middle of the temple. It's used for cleansing. And the water, the, the water drawing ceremony pointed to a day when according to the prophet Joel, God would pour out his spirit on all mankind. Water for them represented the presence of the spirit. And so this celebration would happen every time. In fact, um, I think we're going to look at it in just a second. We're going to see it in just a second. This, this drawing of the water celebration had to happen on the last day of the Feast of Tab- Tabernacles, so day seven. The second is the illumination of the temple. Can you go back to the picture of the temple? Do you mind? Sorry, I'm, I'm just jumping you all over the place, Terry. Terry. The illuminating of the temple, right? One more, perfect. Do you see the four corners? The kind of the towers? So during the Feast of Tabernacles for those seven days, they would build 75 feet tall menorahs. A menorah is a candelabra with um, seven places for light, Okay. They would build these things for this celebration 75 feet high and put one on each of the four corners. And the Jewish historians say that the light from that illumination of the temple was so bright that there wasn't a courtyard in all of Jerusalem that wasn't lit up by the light. I mean, it's hard to imagine no electricity so no, there's no light anywhere unless you light a candle. And when somebody lights four, 75 foot high, with seven giant candles on each end, and in pitch black darkness, it is going to light up for miles. This happened every day during the Feast of Tabernacles. Are you with me? Okay, let's move forward, Terry, to John 7 and 8. John chapter 7 and John chapter 8 is John telling us about one of the three times that Jesus was in Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles because it was a feast you had to go to Jerusalem to celebrate. So Jesus was in Jerusalem. He's celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles. Here's what John says. On the last and most important day of the festival, which is the same day as the water pouring ceremony, and everybody in the city is celebrating the water And they're praying for the Spirit of God to descend upon them. On that day, Jesus stood up and he shouted, If any of you are thirsty, come to me and drink. Have faith in me and you will have life-giving water flowing from deep inside you. Just as the scriptures say, Jesus, this is John now talking, Jesus was talking about the Holy Spirit who would be given to everyone that had faith in him. 
The Spirit had not yet been given to anyone since Jesus had not yet given his full glory. So there's the parade happening, and in the middle of the parade, when that priest is carrying the water that represents for the people the pouring out of God's Spirit, Jesus stands up and says, hey, in the middle of your celebration, you might consider that I'm here. And if you're thirsty, I'll give you living water, and you will never thirst again. Same thing he told the woman at the well. Just a total teachable moment that Jesus took advantage of, but he's not done. Once again, John chapter 8, this was right in the middle of the festival. Once again, Jesus spoke to the people. This time he said, I am the light of the world. Can you imagine being in Jerusalem, no electricity, dark, and they light these giant torches where it's like, ugh, turn them down. Where's my Oakleys? It's bright. But Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. And if you'll follow me, you can stop walking in the dark. You will have light that gives life. Isn't that cool? Jesus took those moments to teach two of the most important things he taught his people. I'm living water. I'm light. I'm everything you need to survive. I'll light your way in a dark world. Pretty cool. Okay, here's the two ways to interpret the fall festivals. The first way is to believe or to uh, come to this understanding that only one has not been fulfilled. Trumpets, the one we talked about last week, which is all about return, all about the return of the Messiah. Blow a trumpet, the trumpet call of God. A lot of Jewish Christians, Jew, Jewish Jesus followers believe that's the only one of the seven not fulfilled. And we're waiting for his return. And this belief would tell you that the Feast of Atonement was fulfilled at the death of Jesus because there's no more need for atonement. How is he going to come fulfill that? He's already done it. And that Sucket was fulfilled at the birth of Jesus. So Jesus was born during the Feast of Tabernacles. The other way to interpret, it, uh, interpret the fall festivals is none of them have been fulfilled. All three are yet to be fulfilled. They're the ones that prophecy, specifically Revelation, is talking about. That trumpets is going to be the rapture of the church. Time out. Rapture is not a Bible word. You never find the word rapture in the scripture, so understand that. Uh, atonement will be the great day of judgment. I kind of lines up because atonement has been called the day of judgment for 4,000 years. And Sucket will be the thousand-year reign when Christ actually lives here again with us. So they both make sense to me. I'm not saying you need to pick a side. I just think you need to understand some Jewish messianic believers think, well, they've all been fulfilled except the one, Jesus returning. And some of them believe, well, I don't think any of them have been fulfilled yet. And the book of Revelation spells out how each one will be fulfilled. Questions? I think both of them are correct. They could be. Because one would be under the Old Testament, or I hope everybody understands what we mean when we say Testament. Or when we built this building, we had a covenant or a contract with Dick Champion to build this thing, and he did his stuff and we paid him. That was the contract. When we say testament or covenant, that's a contract. Jesus fulfilled the contract and is fulfilling the contract. So both could be correct. Both could be. I kind of find myself bouncing between both of them. Any other questions? Got about one minute. Cool. So can we go to look at next semester? So I'm going to let you guys decide what we teach. Um, we're going to start March 27th, which is the Wednesday after spring break. So we've got about a four-week break, and then we'll be back on Wednesday nights. And we will do either Bible lands, how the geography of the Bible can give you faith in the Bible, that everything the Bible says, uh, everywhere the Bible says something happened, you can almost go stand in it and touch it and see it and smell it and take some of it home with you if you're naughty. Bible lands, or kingdoms of darkness. We're going to look at um, cults, what they believe, other religions, and why they're dead wrong. So, 
You circle one of them. Get, we'll, we'll eventually do both, but I want to know which one I'm doing next. <laughs> which one are we doing in March? If you'll circle it, leave it on your table or put it in the box. Matthew, come pray for us and we'll go home.